It's Associated Press, the first. Okay. Does this go out? Do, do Associated Press have uh, television outlets as well, do they? All over the place. Oh, really? Yeah. yeah. ABT. ABTN. Oh, cool. Burton Okay, this has been a little bit of a fascination of yours for a while, yeah? Um, let me ask you this, first of all, what's the meaning of the title? Well, the world's fastest Indian, the Indian of the title is a motorcycle. The Indian was one of America's most famous motorcycles. Uh, it was up there with Harley Davidson, uh, especially in the first half of last century. Uh, and it is still, you know, a bike that's revered amongst collectors of uh, vintage motorcycles. Wow. So, what did you know about I, what did you know about motorcycles before you ever got interested in Burton and Rowe? Well, I knew they were a hell of a lot of fun. I was always passionate about motorbikes. I knew if you fell off them, it hurt. Um, <laughs> a few things like that. And the fun of going fast on a motorbike rivals, you know, it can rival sex, I guess, to some people. <laughs> I think that must be part of the appeal. Yeah. So in the meantime, then, uh, tell us the origin of this, because I know you did the whole documentary. Well. This movie spans my life as a, as a filmmaker, really. This movie started out as a documentary I made when I was in my 20s and uh, has been a passion of mine to make it as a feature film for many, many years. I have written many, many versions of this script over the years. Uh, after I'd finished the studio pictures that I did, I'd be doing press junkets and people would say, well, what are you going to do next? And I'd say, well, I've got this great story. I've been working on it, well, for you know many, many years now, and I'm definitely going to make it one day. And, after I finished my last movie, I thought, you know, time to stop talking about it, time to really make this picture happen. And so I pulled the, the uh, script out of the drawer one more time and, and really did focus on it. I spent a, a year rewriting the script once again, and then another year raising money for the movie, and then another year making it. So it's been a, a big commitment, this movie, and a very personal commitment. And I managed to get uh, a lot of people on side who uh, saw that I had a passion to make this film and became part of the passion of making this film. So basically, are you the Bert, are you the Burt Monroe of uh, movie making? Of filmmaking? <laughs> I don't know. Maybe. Because it certainly sounds like it took a lot of drive. Yeah. It was a big effort to make it, but like anything, it, also, it has also been a very satisfying experience because it, it is... It has been something that I've been thinking about and working on for many, many years, and to finally do it, it put an end to the sort of cycle of thinking about it in a way. So when uh, Bert Monroe, when the character of Bert says, if you don't follow through on your dreams, you're a veg you'll be a You veg might as well be a vegetable. Well, what I think that's pretty you? much my own philosophy of life. Can you quote it for me? Uh, if you don't follow through on your dreams, you might as well be a vegetable. And then the kid says, what sort of a vegetable? And he said, I don't know, a cabbage. Right, so and then that's been a, 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 an adage of yours in your life? Well, I, I do believe personally that uh, following through on the, on the things that you're passionate about can give your own life a sort of sense of satisfaction, that if you've been led off that track and followed maybe, you know, money or, you know, other people's ideas of what you should do with your life, that, you know, those things can, don't lead to the same sort of, the same satisfaction of just of just having a passion and fo following through on it. Now I understand you took, uh, when you were doing the documentary, you took the real Bert Monroe to the Bonneville salt, salt Flats. So you are familiar with this terrain, yeah? I, uh, the first time I ever went to Bonneville was with Bert Monroe. And I will never forget the first time I saw that place. I will never forget the first time I saw, you know, vehicles doing two, three, four hundred miles an hour on the salt flats. Uh, and uh, I'll never forget Burt Bunro. So when you went back there with Anthony Hopkins and uh, Ruby, I mean, how much time did it last? Uh, yeah, one month. Thank you. <laughs> so when you went back there, uh, what did it bring back for you? Well, when I went back there with Anthony Hopkins making the movie and recreating this event that I'd witnessed many years ago, it was a very surreal sort of experience because it was like so vivid in my mind and here it was being recreated. When I went there the first time, I wasn't making feature films. I was, uh, I was beginning my career as a, as a documentary filmmaker. To have gone from there to, to where I was making that film seemed like an enormous, enormous leap, and yet it was still a part of, you know, part of my own life in a way. And how important is it to the story, do you think, that Burt Monroe was from New Zealand? Well, one of the reasons that I wanted to do this movie was that I 
you know, I'm passionate about New Zealand. It was where I made my first movies. And this movie is about, in a way, as much about my own sort of passion for New Zealand and then my own sort of experience of coming to America and the larger than life quality that America has about it. Capturing that sort of, those two places which have been so much a part of my own life uh, to capture my impressions of those places and to make, in a way, a movie that's an homage to both of them is really what I was trying to achieve with this film. So when we see Bert arrive in Hollywood, those are some of your yeah, impressions? Yeah, they were. <laughs> Pretty close to them. <laughs> it's a really nice spot on you, however, I must say. It looks Good. great. Mm -hmm. yeah, All right, is there, is there a little bit of light you can show? I'm not understanding the question. I was just trying to read my question. But oh, I, uh, well, we've got that's some all right. time. That's all right, don't worry about it. Okay. I can wing it. Good. Okay. All right, great. Um, what did you know about Bert Monroe before you started this? I didn't know anything about Burt Monroe. I actually got a call from my agent. They said, they want to see you for the world's fastest Indian. And I said, I'm writing a book right now. I, I don't have time. And they said, well, it's Roger Donaldson. And I said, oh, OK, I love Roger Donaldson. I did 13 days with Roger Donaldson. We became really good friends when we went to Cuba to show that movie to Fidel Castro. And so I had to go. And I didn't know anything about the movie. And I, I walked in, and, I, and Roger looked at me. He goes, God, it was really hard to find you, mate. And I said, well, that's because I didn't want to be found. And he goes, I said, by the way, all my scenes were with Burt Monroe. And I said, who is playing Burt Monroe? And he said, Anthony Hopkins. And my ambivalence vanished, and I prayed to the acting gods, and, and I was good enough in that audition to get in the movie. But I knew nothing about, I knew nothing about any of this world, the world speed world, the, you know, the Bonneville salt flats. I had heard of them, but I didn't know anything about them. You've never even been there? No, never been there. It's an amazing place, amazing place. It's like being on another planet. And, and the, the, the culture that has built up around these, these speed trials uh, and, and racing these incredible machines at five, 600 miles an hour over this salt flat bit, you know, this, it was a giant lake. Um, and uh, has, is, a, is a really cool culture. They're amazing people. And Burt Monroe was just a, is, is like emblematic of all of these guys. They just have this great lust for life and this great camaraderie and this fearlessness. It's just, it's a great group of guys. Wow. So had you ridden motorcycles at all? No, I'm not a big motorcycle guy. I, I, and actually my, my character, Jim Moffat, right, uh, uh, drives one of those big jet cars. As a matter of fact, the first scene I have with Tony Hopkins on the bottom of salt flats, I drive up with this big trailer behind me with this big red car. He goes, is that your car? And he's got this tiny little motorcycle. <laughs> it's great. It's a very funny scene, yeah. Yeah, they had, um, <clears throat> with the, um, the, the motorcycle, it looks, I mean, it's such a relic. Yeah. And this movie was taking place in... It was in the 60s. It, it was actually, it's, he, he was there a number of times from like 62 to 66 or 67. Um, he set the land speed record in 67, I believe. So, but it is definitely a period piece and you get that kind of feeling of, of as a matter of fact, one of the great moments in the, in the film for me <clears throat> and Anthony Hopkins was in that scene where we meet uh, and I introduce myself and I say, Jim Moffat from San Jose, California. And it, to Tony, it was just because Anthony Hopkins loves America and he, because he, when he was a kid, uh, these GIs showed up at his house, and he had this, he's always had this love for the American West and for America and the vastness of it and the cowboys and the promise of it. And he, he said, God, that line, when you say that, all of that love for America comes, came to me. Like, it just welled up inside of him. And it was, he says it's his favorite line in the movie. <laughs> and and it, was wonderful to, it was wonderful that he gave me that because it made me feel like I was really contributing. <laughs> Okay. And so that's our first interview. That's for um, Associated Press. And I hope I wasn't in the at all. Was I? Good. So I guess this, yeah. <laughs> the, um, I'm doing two interviews. The first one is for Associated Press. Yeah. So these will be international. Okay. Can we just say Associated Press on the other one? Associated Press. The sure. first one. Yeah.
Okay. And then uh, you got five minutes for each. Wonderful. Will you tap me right on that one? Okay, thanks. Ready when you are. Okay, turn real quick. Okay. One, two, three. Two separate questions. All right. So what's the meaning of the title? The world's fastest engine. Well, it's the fastest Indian motorcycle ever. That was what he called it, um, and Roger Donaldson called it. Bert actually had uh, chalked in his shed actually, um, something a tribute to the god of speed. That was his motto. Uh, live life to the fullest behind a motorbike because you live more in those five minutes than you can in an entire lifetime because you're facing, you're staring mortality right in the face at 200 miles an hour. And he said that was the most exhilarating thing, experience of his life was doing that. And all his documentary from all his interviews were about uh, really packing as much as you can. He said, otherwise you may as well become a vegetable. He did actually say that. There was another man like that called Donald Campbell. He broke the world speed, world water speed record in um, 1966 at Coniston Lake in the Lake District in England. He was killed in the process of doing it. He was a very angry man. But he used to say when, um, because the press always, you know, the British press, the worst, they need limit. So you ever scared Donald? He said, of course I'm scared. Every time I get in the boat, he said, I'm scared. He said, but that's what courage is. You have come off here. He's been sitting here backside watching television day in and day out, isn't it? He had such contempt for them. He said, until we get in there and do that. Because he, and he was killed actually doing it. But he, he was an amazing guy. And like, like this guy, they just, took life by the horns, and whatever their fears were, they just rode through them. Right, right. Um, what did you know about motorcycles before? Nothing. I still don't know anything about them. No, I'm not a cycle freak. Had you ever ridden at all? Years ago, yeah. But I fell off uh, and uh, nearly broke my back, and that was a long time ago. That was 40-odd years ago. Yeah, I fell uh, very badly from a motorbike. Um, so but getting on this one was, uh, was okay. It's very cramped in there, and uh, I'm a pretty big frame, so it was tight to get in there. It was tough on my back, lower back. I don't have any problems with my back or my spine, but um, that was uh, a tough one. Sometimes we do long days of shooting. But it was nice. It was fun. I, and I enjoyed Bonneville, and I enjoyed New Zealand, and I enjoyed working with Roger again after all those years. How important was it to the story that Bert Monroe was a New Zealander, do you think? Well, he was born there. Does it, did it make a difference that it was uh, in his temperament, in his drive? Do you think it, how do you think the geography affected him, if at all? I've never been asked that before. And, you know, it's, it's, it's interesting you say that because I was talking to some New Zealand actors. This is the dark side of the South, says, I don't want to go there too much. But in Southland, they have a high suicide rate amongst men. And they sing. They, maybe I'm misquoting, but this is what I, uh, witnesses told me. Um, actually, they said it's something to do with national identity because Australia is the big, big, powerful nation next to that on their left, and then America up in the north. And they feel that they have no identity, especially young men. It's quite a high suicide rate. That's interesting. But I don't want to get into the subject because I may be out of my depth. But uh, with Bert, I, you know, Bert was a man who was born in Invercargill, a tiny little t uh, small town, the southernmost city of in the world, facing the Antarctic Ocean. And uh, he was a rural country boy, bought his first bike at the age of 20, and that was his obsession to come to America and race it and, and beat the world record. He's buried there in, uh, next to the motel where I was staying. And uh, his family is still around New Zealand, the Southland. And they came in to visit the set, his children. They're all in their 70s now, John and John Monroe, a bunch of them. Yeah, 50 of them turned up, actually. They have relatives at the premiere, and unf unfortunately, I couldn't be there. Okay. Take more time for anything? Okay, great. <coughs> okay, you're about to um, receive the Lifetime Achievement Award from Golden Globes, from the HFPA. Yeah. Um, what are, is it a, a mixed bag of feelings as this, as this approaches, or...? Why would it be a mixed bag? Well, I just wondered what... Uh, I was reading your um, a comment that someone said, maybe Christopher... I, I can't remember if it was Christopher Lawford's comment, about how when you... Um, you'd always wanted to see your name above the movie on a billboard on Sunset Boulevard. Of course I got to do with this. 
just Why would we even expect? Tell me, explain. Well, I just wondered if it was, uh, I mean, I, I can imagine all the excitement about receiving the lantern. Well, I never get excited about things anymore. I just, you know, pleasantly surprised. Oh, well, that's interesting. I'm a, bit, I'm a little nervous of actually um, making a speech. I don't know what I'm going to say, but I have to think of something to thank a few people without making it long, because some of those speeches at those award shows go on forever, and uh, I don't want to do that. Uh, I don't want the music to play me off. I thank a few people and I'm very grateful and very nice. I'm, I think maybe my own my only feeling is that uh, is that I'm still here and uh, at this age getting an award like that that's pretty nice. I'm pleased. I'm positive about it. But yeah. Okay. And what are some uh, roles that you'd still love to play? Do you know oh, I've no interest in them. I've done everything I needed to. Uh, thank you. Thanks.